Welcome to Friends Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us here today. We're here to help you however we can. So if you haven't done this before, please fill out a short information card. You can click the connection button on our website, or if you're on YouTube, click the link in our description. And if you're on your phone, just text hello friend. that's one word, to 75787. We'd love to be able to say hello. I also wanna invite you to Easter with Friends. It's coming up on April 3rd and 4th. And here at Friends, we love to celebrate Easter because it demonstrates how dead or dying things can still find new life because of Jesus. And we're all about second chances. So please join us for Easter. I'm also excited to let you know that we're launching an all new Friends Online that will have new weekly content and activities for you and for your family. The new Friends Online premieres on April 10, so head over to youtube.com and make sure you subscribe to Friends Church. Lastly, if you support our ministries, we are so grateful for your generosity. And if you want to be able to give then, uh, and, and be able to support what we do locally, around the corner, and around the world, all you have to do is text Friends Give to the number on the screen below. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's head over to worship. Dream wild, oh you heavens, let the praise go 
Well, hello, Friends Church. It is so good to be with all of you here today. My name is Chris Ward, and I am the teaching pastor on staff here at Friends. And at this point, I would ask you, would you grab your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 32? Exodus 32 is where we are today. This week, we are continuing this series, Waymaker, that we have been in, that is inspired by this great song that we sing quite a bit here. And the lyric that's gonna inspire our message today it is a lyric that says, my God, that is who you are. My God, that is who you are. And for that, we're gonna be in Exodus chapter 32. And as you find your place there, I'm gonna hold up something that I am sure probably many of you are familiar with. And that is this thing right here. And don't worry, I'm not gonna say the name of this thing for fear that you have these at home and you're watching and I don't wanna accidentally buy something for you, okay? So I'm just gonna call this an Amazon, okay? This is an Amazon. And I don't know how many of you have one of these. We actually, by last count, we have about five or six of these in our house and we don't have a very big house. And so Amazon is always listening wherever we go. And I'll be honest with you, I have a little bit of a complicated relationship with this thing. On the one hand, I love it because it has made my life a lot more convenient. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm sort of a techie guy. And a lot of things at my house are connected to the internet and therefore I can control them by this thing. I can say, for example, Amazon, turn on all my lights and all my lights downstairs will turn on. I can say, Amazon, raise the thermostat by two degrees and all of a sudden my heater will kick in. Kick in. I can even say, Amazon, lock my front door and my front door will lock. And so in many ways, I love this thing because it has made my life a lot more convenient. On the other hand, however, I will be honest with you, sometimes I get a little frustrated by having one of these things. You know, if you have one of these things, you know that they are all, not always the most reliable thing in the world. Sometimes this won't hear me correctly or sometimes something in my house isn't connected right. And so we as a family will get frustrated with this and we'll let our frustration show. Amazon stop it, we'll say sometimes. Amazon be quiet, we'll say sometimes. We'll sort of bark orders at it, we'll yell at it, we'll throw it across the room. No, I'm just kidding, we won't do that. But we do let our frustration show from time to time. And listen to me, I don't know whether or not it's okay or it's right or wrong to treat a digital assistant that way, right? I don't know whether or not it's right or wrong to treat a computer that way. I guess we'll find out when we get to heaven. But here's what I do know, okay? I do know that it's not right to treat God that way. I do know that it's not right to respond to God that way. You know, I've been told before, brothers and sisters, that sort of every pastor has a burden, that there's sort of one message above all others that every pastor feels a special passion towards, that there's one message above all others that sort of every pastor defaults to whenever he gets the chance. Now, I don't know whether that's not that's true, and I don't know whether or not that's the case for every pastor, but I do know I feel something like that. I do know that almost every time that I teach, that I stand before you on this stage, that there is this burden that I feel, there's this message that I wanna get out. And for those of you who have been here for a while, this won't come as a surprise to you because I talk about it a lot. In fact, I even talked about it a couple of weeks ago. But the burden that I feel more than anything else is I want us all to know who God is. I want us to all know who God is and understand what I mean by that. I want us to know who God really is, not some imitation of him, not some man-made construct of him. You know, it's my belief that there are a lot of misunderstandings out there about our God. That there are a lot of false beliefs out there about our God. Uh, it's, I've been said before, and I believe it's true that God made man in his image and then man returned the favor. God made man in his image, and then we try to make God in our own image. And, and you see that all over the place out there, right? The different beliefs that people have about God, the different ways that people treat God, whether it be like a genie or a digital assistant or something else. But you know what? It's not just out there that there are a lot of misunderstandings about God. Sometimes even in the church, there are misunderstandings about God. And this comes from this recent trend that I've seen over the years of this desire sometimes in the church to what we might say domesticate God, tame God, smooth out what might be called some of the rough edges of God and only focus on those aspects of God that seem agreeable to us. You even see that in the song Waymaker that we're taking as an inspiration for the series. You know, all the characteristics that we talk about God and Waymaker, they are great characteristics and they are true characteristics. Our God is a Waymaker and he is a miracle worker and he is a promise keeper and he is a light in the darkness. He is all those things, absolutely he is. But we need to understand that God is also more than that. And sometimes the more than that is a little bit difficult for us to accept at times. It's a little bit difficult for us to wrap our minds around. 
I've always been drawn to this one church in the verse, rather, in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, verse 23, where the apostle Paul is talking about God and he says this, we'll put it on the screen. He says, see then the kindness and severity of our God. He says, see then the kindness and severity of God. One translation puts it this way. It says, see then the kindness and the harshness of God. And, and, and the Greek word can mean either thing. See then the kindness and harshness of God. Now we talk a lot in the church these days about the kindness of God. But when was the last time you heard a message about the severity of God? about the harshness of God. But that is a part of who God is. God is severe and he is harsh towards sin and towards those who remain in sin. Now, can you imagine singing about that? Waymaker, miracle worker, sin punisher, severe and harsh. My God, that is who you are. Doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? I could never write worship songs because nobody would ever sing them. It doesn't quite have the same ring to it. But I don't know if it's any less true. And I say that by way of introduction, because today we're gonna look at a story that shows us a side of God that we don't talk about a lot. And quite honestly, we may not even like part of it, but it is a part of who God is. And so we need to talk about it. Today, as I said, we find ourselves in Exodus chapter 32. And the background for the passage that we're gonna look at today is that the Israelites are at the base of Mount Sinai, this incredible mountain where God has met with his people and has revealed himself to his people. And the story that happens right before the story that we're gonna look at today is a little bit of what we talked about last week. It's where God gave the Israelites the 10 commandments, this picture of how he wants them to live, of how he wants them to act. And right after God gives the Israelites the 10 commandments, we're told this very important detail. It's found all the way back actually in Exodus 24, 18, but this is the direct context for what we're looking at today in Exodus 32. Exodus 24, 18 says this, we'll put it on the screen. You can also peek there in your Bibles if you want. But in Exodus 24, 18, we're told this, we're told then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Let me read that again. It says, then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And what we're told here is that following the giving of the 10 commandments, Moses heads back up to the top of Mount Sinai where he stays for 40 days and 40 nights, leaving the Israelites at the base of the mountain. And it's this verse then that serves as the context for what we're gonna look at today. Moses, the leader of the Israelites, has been gone out of sight of the Israelites for 40 days and 40 nights. He's basically disappeared from the face of the earth for over a month. And you have to understand what this would have meant for the Israelites. You know, one of the things that we have to understand about Moses is that Moses was not just like the physical leader of the Israelites, sort of like their president or their king or whatever, but but Moses was also the spiritual leader of the Israelites. He was their connection to God. In fact, as you read through the book of Exodus, you will see God very rarely deals with the Israelites directly. No, when he wants to get across something to the Israelites, he will go through Moses. Well, now Moses is gone. Their connection to God has disappeared. Their spiritual leader is missing. And you can imagine the effect that it's had on the Israelites. I don't know if you've ever heard the stories before of families who sort of lose their spiritual leader. Maybe there was a, a grandmother or a grandfather who had a strong faith in that family and then that person passes away. And sometimes when that happens, the, the family kind of starts to fall apart spiritually. Well, that seems to be what happens with the Israelites. They, they seem to sort of fall apart spiritually. Verse one of Exodus 32, and you'll see what I mean. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And you see, don't you, the panic that's in the Israelites. They they go to Aaron, who is the number two in charge of them, but number two by a distant second, I need to say. And they say to Aaron, Aaron, we have no idea where Moses is. And really what they're saying by that too is, Aaron, we have no idea where God is. And so they say to Aaron, Aaron, you need to make us gods who will lead us. You need to make us gods who are in charge of us. And this is Aaron's response, verse two of Exodus 32. It said, Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what he handed them and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And so we see what Aaron does here, right? He, he takes off, he has the Israelites take off all their jewelry and he melts down their jewelry and he fashions out of it a golden calf that the Israelites begin worshiping. And this then sets up what is probably one of the more famous stories in the Bible. 
and the very famous incident of the golden calf and all that follows after it. It's one of those very rare stories in the Bible that even those who don't know a lot about the Bible, they know something about this story. But let me tell you something, okay? Like a lot of famous stories in the Bible, this is one that I think is commonly misunderstood. And it's one where I think there's a little bit more than meets the eye in this particular story. You know, usually when the story of the golden calf gets taught, it's taught in such a way that the Israelites, what they're really doing here is they're breaking the first commandment, right? Where God said, you shall have no other gods before me. And by building this golden calf and by worshiping it, obviously they're doing that. And so the lesson that usually comes out of this is, you know, we need to destroy the golden calves in our own lives. We need to get rid of the idols in our own lives. And definitely, I think there's some of that going on here. But there's something else really interesting going on in this story. I want you to pick it up in verse 5 of Exodus 32. This is the very next verse right after what we just read. I want you to see what happens here right after they make the golden calf. Exodus 32, 5. It says, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Now let me read that again. It says, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. And so what we read here is right after this golden calf gets fashioned, what Aaron does is he builds an altar in front of it. And then he says, tomorrow we're going to have a festival. Tomorrow we're going to have a party, he says. But I want you to notice, who is this party dedicated to? Who is this party in honor of? Well, in one sense, it's dedicated to the calf, yes. But look at what Aaron says at the end of verse 5. He says, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. And he knows how to the Lord there is in all capital letters. Remember a few weeks ago, I told you whenever you see the Lord in all capital letters, pay attention to that because that signifies something. And what does it signify? Well, what it signifies is that in the original Hebrew, God's personal name is being used here. And that's exactly what is happening here. You could translate the end of verse five this way. Tomorrow, there will be a festival to Yahweh, the one true God. And so what we read here is right after building this golden calf and right after building an altar in front of it, Aaron says, tomorrow we're going to have a party, and this party is going to be dedicated to Yahweh. This party is going to be dedicated to the one true God. Now, what in the world is going on here? Well, let me do my best to explain, okay? I don't know if any of you parents out there, if you ever had to go on a trip when your kids were really young, maybe a business trip or something like that, and you knew that your kids were going to miss you. And so maybe one of the things that you did, and in fact, child psychologists suggest that you do something like this. Maybe one of the things that you did is you bought your child a stuffed animal right before you left, a teddy bear, something like that. And you handed this to your kid and you said to your son or daughter this, you said, hey, if at any time you miss me during this trip, all you have to do is hold on to this stuffed animal and it's like, I'm there with you. And if you've ever done that before, you know there is a sense in which that works. Uh, I was remembering this past week, a few years ago, my my son Lucas was having trouble going to preschool because he missed his mom and dad at preschool. And I remember there's one day where it was particularly tough and he didn't want to go. And all of a sudden I came up with this idea and I went to a drawer and I got a few pipe cleaners and I made three bracelets out of those pipe cleaners. And I gave one to Lucas to wear, one to my wife to wear, and I put one on. And I said to Lucas this, I said, Lucas, if any time while you're at school, if you miss us, all you have to do is hold on to this pipe cleaner, hold on to this bracelet. And it's like, we're there with you. And I'll never forget, Lucas closed his eyes and he was crying at that time. He closed his eyes, he held on to that pipe cleaner, he held on to that bracelet, and all of a sudden this huge smile came across his face. And he said something like this, he said, Mom, Dad, it works, it's magic, you're, you're there with me. You see, these tangible objects, these physical objects, they have the effect of comforting our kids and reminding them that we are there with them. Well, the reason I share that with you It's because many scholars today believe that something like that is probably going on here with the golden calf. You see, the predominant view among scholars today, and I always want to bring you the latest research whenever I I, I teach, but the predominant view among scholars today is that in the incident of the golden calf, the Israelites actually aren't so much breaking the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Though I think there is probably some of that going on here. But the predominant view among scholars today is that in the incident of the golden calf, the Israelites are more breaking the second commandment. And what's the second commandment? Well, the second commandment is the commandment where God expressly forbids any statues of him. You can read about this in Exodus 24. God very clearly says, he says, you shall make no graven images of me. You can't make images of me. You can't make statues of me and worship them. 
And this, by the way, is something really unique about the Jewish faith and in turn the Christian faith. If you know anything about other religions, you know that in most other religions, they have statues of their God that they worship. We don't have that. Why? Why, when we gather together on the weekends, don't we have a giant statue of Jesus on the stage that we bow down to and we worship? Well, the reason why is because God has expressly forbid that. God doesn't want us to make statues of him and worship him in that way. Well, a lot of scholars believe today that that is what the Israelites are doing here. Remember, right? Moses has been gone for over a month. The Israelites don't know if he's ever coming back. And since Moses is their connection to God, God in a sense has been gone for over a month. They don't know where he is and and they're probably scared. They're like our kids when we leave them for a while. And so what do the Israelites need? Well, they think they need a teddy bear. They need a bracelet. They need a tangible reminder that God is with them. And that's probably what this calf is. You see, this story is probably not so much a story of the Israelites turning away from the true God to other gods. Why else would they have a festival dedicated to the true God? The Israelites weren't abandoning God. They were just worshiping him in a way that was easier for them, in a way that was more comfortable for them. It's for that reason we might be tempted to look at this story through a different lens. And we might be tempted to go, okay, well then what's the big deal? In fact, I shared this detail with someone a few days ago and they said exactly that. They said, okay, well then why does God get so mad? If the Israelites aren't really abandoning the true God or putting other gods before him, if they're just worshiping God in a way that seems more convenient for them, then why does God get so angry? And we'll see in a second, God does get angry. In fact, 3,000 Israelites lose their lives as a result of this particular incident. And that may seem like an overreaction to us, right? Why does God get so angry? Isn't this just a misunderstanding? Isn't this just an action done out of fear? Aren't they still worshiping him just in a different way? So why is it such a big deal? Well, the reason why it's such a big deal is this. It's because God expressly said not to do that. And that should be enough. It's because God expressly said not to do something like this. And that should be enough. And that goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. You know, I think sometimes we forget who we're dealing with when we deal with God. Yes, God is a way maker and he is a promise keeper and he is a miracle worker and he is a light in the darkness. He is all those things, of course he is. But God is also more than that. We don't talk a lot about this aspect of God today anymore, but God is also holy and God is righteous and God is just. And there is a standard by which God himself lives and he desires that those who follow after him follow that same standard. This is something that is missed a lot today in common discussions about God. You know, if I can sort of characterize the God that I think a lot of people believe in these days, it's the God with no standard. It's the God who basically says, hey, you can do whatever you want to do. You can be whoever you want to be. As long as it makes you happy, it's okay with me. And that's almost the the hymn today, isn't it? It's almost the mantra today. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whatever you want to be. As long as it makes you happy, then it's okay with me. And that's a very popular uh, uh, view that's out there. In fact, I got a picture of this just the other day. The other day I was doing one of those kind of online exercise classes. And at the beginning of that class, the instructor said something like this. He said, if you came here with a bad attitude today, he said, you need to fix it. He said, if you came here with a bad attitude today, he said, you need to fix it. And then like 90 seconds later, it's so interesting. He stopped himself in the middle of the workout and he said this. He said, hey, I need to, I need to apologize for what I said earlier. Because by saying you need to fix something, I was implying that you're broken. And then he said this. He said, none of you are broken. None of you are broken. And that's a very attractive message. And it's a very popular message these days. But it's not a biblical one. And I don't think it's what God says to us. I'm going to share with you this verse, Matthew 15, 19. We'll put it on the screen. Jesus is speaking here and he says this. He says, for out of the heart comes evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. For out of the heart, Jesus says, comes evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. And here Jesus is talking about all the wrong things of the world, all the bad things of the world. And I want you to notice, where does Jesus say all the wrong things of the world come from? What does he say? He says they come from the heart. They come from our heart. Now talk about the exact opposite message of what we receive today. The world tells us we need to follow our heart, right? Because the impulses of our heart are good. And so we need to follow our heart. And Jesus says the exact opposite. He says, no, the impulses of our heart are often bad. And we need to deny them. We need to say no to them. In fact, if I could paraphrase what what Jesus says here, I'd paraphrase it this way. What Jesus is telling us here is he's telling us in many ways we are broken. 
We are broken. And by the way, there is a word that the Bible uses for our brokenness. And it's another very unpopular word, but we need to hear it. It is the word sin. According to the Bible, we are are sinners. We are sinful. We sin. And sin is the predominant word in this story. It's interesting. Up until Exodus chapter 32, the word sin had only been used 10 times in the book of Exodus altogether. When we get to the story of the golden calf, the word sin is used 11 times in this story alone. This is a story about sin. The Israelites followed their heart. They did what they thought was right and best. And God says that it was a sin. And one of the things that we find in the Bible is that sin often carries with it consequences. It carries with it ramifications. And that's what we see in this passage. There are two big consequences that God brings upon the Israelites for their sin. One I've already talked about. 3,000 Israelites, probably those who were the most guilty of this particular incident, they're killed. They lose their lives. You see this in verse 27. It says, And Moses said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and his friend and his neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 people died. So 3,000 people lose their lives for this incident. And then the second consequence that God brings upon the Israelites is he brings some sort of sickness. He brings some sort of plague. You see that in verse 35. It says, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Sickness and death. That's the consequence for their sins. And I want to let you know, and this by far will be the most controversial thing that I say today because I know some of you have never heard this before. But I want to let you know that our sins today can carry with it the same consequences. I know it's common for us to look at this and say, well, this is the Old Testament, right? This is before Jesus. God doesn't deal with sin with his people in this way anymore. And that's a very popular belief. But it's not what the Bible teaches. As I was reading this story, for example, I couldn't help but think of the famous story of Ananias and Sapphira. Some of you know that story. It's in Acts chapter 5. This is after Jesus. This is after his death and it's after his resurrection. The church is already meeting and there's this couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira and they want to impress the church and the way they want to impress the church is with how much money they're giving the church and so they lie. And what happens to them? Both of them struck dead right on the spot, presumably killed by God as a consequence for their lying, for their disobedience. As I read this story, I was also thinking of the church in Corinth. Some of you know about the church in Corinth. They were a messed up church. They were doing a lot of things wrong. They were taking advantage of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 11.30 that there is a, a consequence that they're facing for that. This is what he says. He says, that is why many of you are sick, weak and sick, and quite a few are dead. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and quite a few of you are dead. And what Paul is saying there is that there is a sickness that has come over the church in Corinth. It's killed some people, and it is a direct result of their disobedience. It's a direct result of their sin. Now, I don't know if God does this a lot these days anymore, but sin almost always carries with it some sort of consequence, ramification, whether it be broken relationships, broken trust, setbacks in life, or even worse. This is the severeness. This is the harshness of God towards sin. And I know what some of you are thinking, Chris, this is, this is kind of a bleak message. You know, I watch church to be encouraged and you're not really encouraging me here today. And I understand that because as I said, we don't, we don't hear a lot about this in the church these days. But let me ask you a question. If we don't hear these sorts of things in the church, then where are we supposed to hear them? If we can't talk about the difficult things of God in the church, then where are we supposed to talk about them? You know, I believe that the role that God has given me is I am to talk to us about God. I am to teach us about God. And I can't lie to you. I can't deceive you. I can't can't misrepresent God. And we can't sweep the parts of God that we don't like under the rug. In fact, if there's one thing that the story of the golden calf teaches us, it teaches us that we need to come to God on his terms and not on ours. And so we need to hear about these things. But at the same time, we need to realize something, okay? And that is that the severeness of God, the harshness of God, that is not the final word. And that is not the end of the story. Now make no mistake about it, God is upset at what the Israelites have done here. And for a while, he wants to abandon them altogether. He wants to to leave them as a result of what they've done. You see this in Exodus chapter 33, verse 3. He says this, he says, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people. That's an image of stubbornness. And I might destroy you on the way. So God decides to almost abandon the Israelites. And and to Moses, this is absolutely unacceptable. 
Moses cannot imagine life without God, and so he pleads with God, and he appeals to God's grace and God's mercy. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the people on the face of the earth? And you can hear the angst in Moses' voice, right? He cannot imagine life without God. And so here God's, here's God's response, Exodus thirty three seventeen, And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and know you by name. And so God decides not to abandon the Israelites. And listen, I know there's some questions in some circles about whether or not God changed his mind here or whether or not God can change his mind. And that's a very interesting question, but it takes us beyond the, the point that's being made here. The point that's being made here is this, God decides to show mercy and grace. Though God would be absolutely justified in abandoning the Israelites altogether, God decides not to treat them in the way that they deserve. And this is God's last word on their sin here. And this is God's last word on our sin too. For those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, though sin often does carry with it consequences in this life. It does not carry with it final condemnation. No one who believes in Jesus will be condemned at the end of time for their sin, why? for no other reason than God is kind. And he has made a way for our sins to be forgiven through Jesus Christ. And that's God's last word on our sin as well. And I know, brothers and sisters, this is a bit of an odd message. I know that. Trust me, if you struggle with this message, I have struggled with it a lot more. But what I'm trying to do with this message, as failed as my attempt may be, is I'm trying to hold a tension that we see, not only just in the Bible, but attention that I believe we see in God himself. And that is this, if I could express all I'm trying to say today and what I think this story is trying to teach us, I'd express it this way. God wants obedience and we need to give it to him. God gives us grace and we need to accept it from him. God wants obedience and we need to give it to him. God gives us grace and we need to accept it to him. First, accept it from him. First, God wants obedience and we need to give it to him. Listen to me, the Christian faith is not the faith of do whatever you want. It's not the faith that says that God wants us to be happy above all else. So as long as you're happy, then then you can do whatever you want. No, the Christian faith is more about holiness than it is about happiness. Now, I believe true holiness leads to true happiness. But holiness comes first. Said another way, God wants us to live a certain way. And he has not been unclear about how he wants us to live. You find it all over the pages of this book. In fact, I'd encourage you this week, read Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Read the Sermon on the Mount, and you will find in no uncertain terms how God wants us to live, how he wants us to watch what we say, for example, how he wants us to do what we can to eliminate lust in our lives, how he wants us to be generous with what he has given us. And and let me tell you something. Those are not suggestions, okay? I know we don't like this word, but, but those are commands, Remember who we're dealing with when we're dealing with God. We're dealing with the all-powerful God of the universe, the one who gave us life, and he deserves our obedience. God wants obedience, and we need to give it to him. But at the same time, we need to understand that we will not always do what God asks us to do. We, We will fail sometimes. And when we fail, we need to understand this. We need to understand that God gives us grace, and we need to accept it from him. God gives us grace and we need to accept it from him. One of the reasons I struggle with messages like this is, as I know some of you struggle with guilt and shame. You know that God wants obedience and you know that you don't always give it to him. And and therefore messages like this reinforce the guilt and shame that you feel. And, And that's why you need to hear this part. God gives us grace and we need to accept it from him. I was having lunch with someone the other day and by their own admission, they've made a lot of mistakes in their life. And they felt guilt and shame because of that. And he told me how after one particular bad mistake he made, he went to church one Sunday and the pastor was speaking on Romans chapter eight, verse one. And as the pastor read this, this man knew that that God was speaking to him. This verse was for him. And Romans eight, one says this, it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's true. Though God desires obedience, We are not condemned when we sin. We are not condemned when we mess up if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. God wants obedience and we need to give it to him. God gives us grace and we need to accept it from him. And I know it's messy, but that's how I know it's real. We human beings don't like messiness. That's why we create something like this. Just do what I say and get it over with. God's not like that. And we need to understand that. And so I close today with with two simple questions. The first one is this, where do you need to take obedience to God more seriously today? 
Where do you need to take obedience to God more seriously today? Is there a sin you have tolerated in your life? Is there, a, is there an idol that needs to be smashed? Have you accepted disobedience in your life in an area where you know that God is calling you to obedience? Where do you need to take obedience to God more seriously? And then second, where do you need to accept God's grace in your life? What are you condemning yourself for that God doesn't condemn you for? Where do you, what do you need to do to forgive yourself? Where do you need to forgive yourself? Where do you need to accept God's grace in your life? And in fact, as we close here today, I wanna to pray this over you. So would you bow your heads with me wherever you are and would you pray with me? So Father God, we come before you in the midst of a difficult passage, in the midst of a difficult message, God. But I hope, Father, in a, attempt to just to get to know you better and who you are, all of you, Father, not just the bits and pieces that we may like the most, but God, all of who you are. And Lord, we see in this passage your holiness and we see in this passage your righteousness and we see in this passage the obedience that you desire. And so God, I pray that obedience over us, Lord. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that we would have the, the, the strength and the faith and the courage to do what it is that you have called us to do, Father. I pray for those who in whatever area of their life right now maybe have know what you want them to do, God, but you, they haven't been doing it, Father. I pray that you would speak through me right now and this message would be the motivation that they need to, to, to align their lives with you and with your word and, and I believe see the blessing that comes as a result of that, God. So would you instill within us that desire, Father, for obedience? But at the same time, God, we know we will mess up. And that's why we thank you that you've made a provision for us. You've made forgiveness for us through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And I pray, God, that we would forgive ourselves for those times that we have failed, that we would not condemn ourselves, Lord, for the time, for the things that you don't condemn us for, Lord. And we would be reminded of the incredible grace that you pour over us, Lord. God, I'm reminded of a lyric from another song that we sing that says this. It says, our sin was great, but your grace was greater. And that's what we believe. You have grace greater than our sin, Father. And we thank you for that. And God, I pray for each and every person watching right now, Lord, I pray that our pursuit in this life would be to, to know you better, to know who you are through your word, God, and to honor you and respect you and worship you in the way that you call us to. Because God, there is no greater calling and there is no greater privilege than that in life. And so Father, we love you so much. We thank you. We thank you for the gift that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray right now. Amen.
Well, once again, we want to thank you for joining us here this weekend. And I know we talked about a lot of stuff, some of it really serious. And listen, we as a church, we're here to help you and come alongside you. So if there's any questions that you have or any support that you need, we, we'd love to help you. All you have to do is go to our website, friends.church, and contact us that way, and someone will follow up with you and get you plugged into the life of our community and what is going on here. But we want to thank you so much for joining us here this weekend. I pray that you each have a great week. God bless each and every one of you, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.